3D printing friends, today on the BV3D channel we'll take a look at this enormous 3D printer from Chidi Tech. Stick around and we'll get into it right after this. I'm Brian and you are watching BV3D. This episode of the BV3D channel is brought to you in part by these awesome channel members. Becoming a member is a great way to support the channel and has a few perks besides just getting your name and lights here. Click the join button to find out more. Hi, welcome back. Hey, if you're new here and you're wanting to learn about 3D printing, 3D modeling, and other 3D printing related stuff, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. Okay, so today we're going to get a look at this huge 3D printer, the iFast from Chidi Tech. Big thanks to Chidi Tech for sending this beast over so I could show it to you. So let's just dive right in and go over the specs. First off, this is a dual extruder printer. The extruders are on the same carriage, and a clever mechanism raises the extruder that's not currently printing up and out of the way so it doesn't drag across the print in progress. So this is not an IDEX printer. IDEX stands for Independent Dual Extruders. These extruders aren't independent, they're codependent. Maybe we should call this Codex, Codependent Dual Extruders. Anyway, Chidi Tech also includes a complete high temperature dual extruder assembly for printing more industrial level materials. The hot ends can get up to 300 degrees Celsius. It has several options for printing, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, and USB drive. With the printer connected to Wi-Fi or Ethernet, you can send files to it from the slicer. Or you can copy the files from the slicer to the USB drive and then put the USB drive in the printer and print that way. It has a large build volume, 330 millimeters on the X, 250 millimeters on the Y, and 320 millimeters on the Z. And all three axes are on linear rails. And it can print in a single nozzle mode, which increases that X dimension to 360 millimeters. It has an actively heated enclosure that can get up to 60 degrees Celsius. It can print PLA, PETG, TPU, ABS, nylon, and polycarbonate. It's got a clear lid that you'll leave on when you need the enclosure heated and take off when you don't. So on for ABS, ASA, nylon, and polycarbonate, off for PLA, PETG, and TPU. This is a physically imposing machine at 710 millimeters wide, 510 millimeters deep and 670 millimeters tall. And it's got a five inch color touchscreen. The marketing materials said it's an ultra full color touchscreen, but the colors they've chosen are all shades of blue, except for the stop button, that one's red. I mean, I like it, but I kind of think they could have done more with it. It's got an onboard camera so you can monitor the print in progress, sort of, I'll get to that later. The Chidi Print Slicer, based on Cura, is available for Mac OS, Windows, and Linux computers. The printer also comes with a good set of accessories. It includes a textured PEI flex plate in addition to the flex plate with the BuildTac style print surface. It also includes some nice hex drivers, a nice standard screwdriver, and a spare parts kit that includes a pair of replacement brass nozzles with PTFE liners and a full 1 kg spool of PLA. It has a user guide that's pretty good, but the videos included on the USB flash drive are better. The videos are short and to the point, usually only one or two minutes long. There are videos showing how to adjust the bed, how to load and unload filament, how to calibrate or align the two extruders, as well as how to get the printer on a wired or wireless network, swap in the high temperature extruders, and of course, how to unbox and unpack the printer and get all the shipping materials out of the print chamber. The only plot twist here is that you have to unbox the printer to get to where the flash drive is to find out how to unbox the printer. And here's a hint. Cut the tape on the top of the box, unfold the flaps, and you'll find the flash drive, the user guide, and the textured PEI build plate right on top. After that, follow the directions in the guide or watch the videos to see how to properly unbox the printer. Once you have the printer unpacked, the first thing to do is manually level or tram the bed. Yes. Sadly, this big industrial style printer doesn't have automatic bed leveling. While the printed user guide covers the basic steps to level, it's incomplete. So watch the leveling videos on the flash drive. It's important because they show how to get both extruders at the same level. The manual doesn't show that. That said, it's easy to do. The flash drive also contains the Mac OS and Windows versions of the Chidi Print Slicer, 
but I suggest going to their website to download the most current version of it and install that. Once it's installed, open it up, go through the first run stuff, and then you can start slicing and printing. The very first print I ran on the iFast was this pre-sliced test model. It's a tall rectangle underneath a tall, hollow cylinder. It took a little over an hour and a half to print. This was printed in the red PLA that came with the printer, and it turned out pretty nice. The layers look very consistent, I don't see any extrusion issues, and overall it's just a nice print. Then I sliced and Wi-Fi printed this spool holder flange, which also came out great. I'll talk more about why I had to print this part in a little bit. For now, we're looking at the result. This took an hour and 56 minutes to print. Nice, consistent layers, good surface finish, and I have no complaints about it. After that, I sliced and printed a Benchy, which took an hour and 45 minutes to print. It came out really good. Parts cooling seems adequate. There wasn't any curling up of the layers on the bow as it printed. Just as a side note, it seems like the print times for things sliced with the default fine 0.2 millimeter settings in the Chidi Print Slicer don't seem to be any faster than printing on just about any other printer. But there's a quick 0.2 millimeter setting in the slicer, so I sliced the Benchy again using that, and it took an hour and 27 minutes to print. This one came out good as well and looks just like the first one. If I hadn't written the print times on the bottoms of them, I wouldn't be able to tell them apart. When calculating how much faster the quick Benchy was compared to the fine Benchy, the quick one was 21% faster, and that's not too shabby. So then I ran the same test with a longer print, this time Luby's Aria the Dragon. Here she is printed using the fine setting. Looks pretty good with just a little bit of stringing. And here's Aria printed using the quick setting. Still looks good, but the front legs don't look quite as good as the one I printed using fine and there's a little bit more stringing. So the one sliced and printed using fine took 2 hours 54 minutes and quick took 2 hours 36 minutes. Calculating Aria's percent faster on the quick setting shows that it's only 12% faster. So far, these speeds are pretty much in the Ender 3 range. So where's the fast in iFast? I don't know. I sliced Aria using the 0.2 millimeter normal settings in Prusa Slicer for the Ender 3 S1 and printed it on an Ender 3 S1 Pro. It took 2 hours, 48 minutes. So, compared to an Ender 3 S1 Pro, the printing speed of Aria the Dragon using the fine setting is a little slower and a little bit faster with a quick setting. I compare it against the S1 Pro because, like the iFast, it's a direct drive extruder. Okay, setting the whole fast thing aside, this printer has two extruders, so I loaded up a second spool of PLA and printed the calibration model and got the extruders aligned. Then I sliced and printed a D6 and 45 minutes later it was done. Unfortunately there was a layer shift early in the print and that made me sad. So I printed it again and this time it did it again in the exact same place. No idea what was going on there. Next up I tried a Benchy in two colors and that was a bit of a disaster. I mean the same thing happened, there was a layer shift but it was higher up than it was on the dice. And you can even see it on the ooze shield. The ooze shield does cut down on the amount of filament bits that ooze off the inactive extruder, but it also blocks cooling airflow from the parts cooling fans. So the bow of the Benchy is kind of ugly, which happens when a Benchy doesn't get enough cooling when it's being printed. The layers on the bow tend to curl up as a result. While troubleshooting the layer shift issue on dual material prints, I re-sliced and printed the Benchy with the bow facing into the wind, so to speak. In other words, it was pointed toward the parts cooling fan ducts. Now this didn't affect the layer shifting at all, which occurred on what looks like the exact same layer, but it did fix the cooling on the bow. I spent quite a while going back and forth with Chidi Tech support, trying to get this weird layer shift issue resolved. They asked me to send them the files that I printed, so I sent them the files the slicer sent to the printer because the printer stores those on the USB drive. Now the slicer compresses them as .tz files, so they don't take as long to send to the printer over the network. But Chidi Tech's support said they couldn't uncompress the files. Like, your slicer made those files and your printer can read them, why can you not open them? I wanted them to use the files that I sliced and printed so they could look at them because those specific files were layer shifting during printing. Instead, they ended up having me send them STL files and .3MF files, and they sliced one of them and sent the G-code back to me so I could print it. 
and it did the exact same thing as when I sliced and printed them. After even more back and forth email exchanges, they suggested that I swap the standard extruder for the high temperature set. And I was super skeptical of that, but it totally fixed the issue. I asked him if I could just leave the high temp set installed and just print my regular temp material, like the PLA that was included with the printer, but they said it might have jamming problems. So I ended up swapping the regular temp extruders back onto the printer and it's been working fine ever since. Now maybe it was just a connector issue with the cable that connects to the extruders, but I'm at a loss to explain it. And the problem seemed to be with this specific printer, not with the iFast in general. Now, I'm not going to lie, that issue and the length of time it took to get it worked out kind of put me off the printer for a while. To their credit though, the people I was dealing with at GD were overall helpful and we did eventually get the issue resolved. I also did a two material print using supports printed in PVA. This material dissolves in water, so in theory you can print some pretty complex geometries that would be next to impossible with regular support materials. Now this one is an oldie but a goodie with a pair of enclosed gears that I grabbed from Thingiverse. The red filament is the Chidi Tech PLA, and the clear-ish filament is Polymaker's PVA. So to remove the supports, you just have to submerge the model in water and wait for the support material to dissolve. It can take a long time, and it seems to work better when the water is hotter. Now that said, I ended up letting it sit overnight, and then I still had to run it under hot water to get all the support material to dissolve. Also, I think I had the water a little too hot because part of the PLA curled a little bit. But the gears spin freely, if a bit too loose, and this is a model that would have been impossible to print with standard supports. So earlier, I mentioned that the printer had a camera that you could use to monitor the print chamber. The camera's power can be turned on or off from the touchscreen on the printer, and that's the extent of its integration. So the experience of using it is substandard. It's an off-the-shelf security camera, just a small cube-shaped thing with its own Wi-Fi radio. And unfortunately, the only way to view the camera is to use a mobile app. With the app installed, you can either switch your mobile device to the camera's Wi-Fi network and view it while you're near the printer, or you can add the camera to an existing Wi-Fi network, maybe a guest network, and then you'll be able to view it from anywhere. This is literally no different from buying a standalone Wi-Fi connected camera and putting it inside the printer. It doesn't have any method at all to control the printer, so if you start a print before you leave for work, and you check on the print a little while later and it's failing horribly, all you can do is look on in shock and despair because you won't be able to pause or stop the printer. And that's because the app is exclusively focused on the camera. Honestly, the inclusion of the camera feels like it was just done to add a bullet point to the feature list, but no real thought went into how it would be used. Also, the camera's Wi-Fi functionality is very basic, and if your Wi-Fi network's name has any special characters in it, like, oh, a space, the camera won't be able to connect to it at all. If I sound a little grouchy about that, it's because the name of the Wi-Fi network I wanted to connect it to has a space in it. And I have other stuff connected to the network already, so I'm not going to change the network name and then have to reconnect all the other devices to the Wi-Fi network's new name. So, on to other things. The flanges that Chidi Tech normally includes for their spool holders didn't ship with this printer. Without them, the spools tend to wander around on the holder and can eventually drift off to the side. So, I spent a few minutes... Ah, I knocked over my dragon. So I spent a few minutes in Tinkercad and designed a replacement. These each took about two hours to print, so eight hours in total, but that was faster than waiting for new ones to ship. Plus, it gave me a chance to put more time on the printer. A minor issue I've got with the printer is the location of the USB port. It's right by the door handle, and when the flash drive is plugged in, it sticks out like a sore thumb, just begging to get snapped off. I had that complaint about the Chidi Tech iMate S as well, and I tried to solve it by purchasing a two-pack of super small 16 gig flash drives from Amazon for about 12 bucks. These just barely stick out of the printer, so they're not likely to get bumped. Unfortunately, I ran into issues multiple times when I sent print jobs to the printer via Wi-Fi, and they failed with an error indicating a bad line in the G-code file. So the printer doesn't like the flash drives I bought, but it does work fine with the one that it came with. Now, it may sound like I'm unhappy with the printer, but that's not the case. It's not a bad printer. 
After all, it's fully enclosed with an actively heated chamber for printing high temp materials. The lighting in the build chamber is good, lets you get a good look at the model that you're printing. The full color touchscreen on the printer is pretty big, and I like that when the print job gets sent via Wi-Fi, it includes a thumbnail of the model being printed. But in the slicer, using the settings it comes with, the iFast isn't particularly fast. I kind of feel like the target market for this printer is more toward the professional side of 3D printing rather than the hobbyist side, but then there are features missing that you kind of expect on a professional grade 3D printer. For instance, automatic mesh bed leveling. The omission of that feature on the iFast stands out that much more. So I kind of feel like it's straddling the line between prosumer and lower end pro level machines. And that's not a bad thing. There are people who have bought this printer and love it. Some people need that heated chamber and need the build volume, but given the price of it, I would have expected a few more features or for some of them to have been better implemented. Yes, print chamber camera, I'm looking at you. Well, 3D printing friends, that's about all the time we have for this episode. And now that we're at the end, let's go print something cool. Hey, real quick before you go, I wanted to say thanks for being one of the super awesome people who sticks around all the way to the end, and thanks for all the likes, comments, and shares. And an especially big thanks to those who directly support what I do. You're all wonderful for doing that, and I really appreciate it. If you liked this episode, a thumbs up would be great, and if you'd like to help support the channel, check the description for ways you can do exactly that. And hey, if you haven't already subscribed, please do. It's absolutely free, and it's an excellent way to help keep me making these videos for you. Well, that's it for this one. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time here on the BB3D channel.